Before I call the honourable member for McKellar, I remind the House that this is the honourable member's first speech, and I ask the House to extend to him the usual courtesies. The honourable member for McKellar. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It is an honour to stand here before you today, representing the people of McKellar. The northern beaches of Sydney are my home and the only community I have ever wanted to represent. The story of how I came to be here is not uncommon, yet it represents everything I love, everything I admire and everything I hope for Australia's future. The son of a Polish migrant who fled communist oppression in 1957, my father came to Australia as a young man. His father, my grandfather, had fled Poland when the Nazis invaded. Returning to his home after the war, he changed his name to avoid discrimination. He met his wife, my grandmother, in the USSR. She was recovering from the siege of Leningrad. When my grandparents looked to flee the old world of ancient grudge to a new world of hope and opportunity, they chose Australia. There is little that I can say or do to repay my gratitude for their choice. Polish Jews, half a world away from anything they had ever known, they arrived here with nothing. No assets, no income, no connections. With the promise of a better life sustaining her, my grandmother spent her nights screwing caps on toothpaste tubes, often coming home with bleeding fingers. My father sold encyclopedias door to door so he could learn English faster. Unfortunately, Mr Speaker, most of what he learnt he couldn't use, and none can be repeated here. <laughs> Meanwhile, on the northern beaches of Sydney, my mother's parents, an Irish Catholic and an English Protestant, were getting married, overcoming a divide of history and tradition, religion and upbringing. <coughs> At a time when in, a, when, in other parts of this world, Catholics and Protestants were still at war. It is remarkable that two people from such improbably different backgrounds would meet. But the most remarkable part is that in Australia, it is not that remarkable at all. In McKellar, as in too few parts of this world, I, a child of all those nations, all those cultures and all those religions, grew up to stand here before you today, to represent every single member of my community that in their own way contributed to making this a great nation. As anyone who has started their own business from the ground up will tell you, it is the most frustrating, engrossing, stress-inducing, yet strangely satisfying thing you can do. It is when I started my own business at the age of 34 that I understood what governments should truly be about. I dreamed of creating beautiful furniture and equipment, a business that would employ people. Importantly, a business that would enrich and improve the lives of those in aged care. It is my most fundamental belief that a government's role is to enable, not create, not dictate, but enable all of us to reach our full potential. A good government should enable individuals to thrive. It should enable businesses to flourish. It should enable communities to prosper. Instead, over the years, successive governments have heaped program upon initiative upon program upon us, creating a thicket of regulations whose purposes no one can any longer remember. Governments should do less, but what they do do, they should do better. Liberals have never believed in a world of no government, just the dangers of unlimited government. No government of a free people has ever had to build a wall to keep its citizens in. I believe in a world of limited government, a world in which the government gets out of the way, in which it encourages and allows companies and industries to adapt to the future, to innovate and push the boundaries in order to remain competitive. In that world, governments too should remain nimble and flexible in their, governments, in their governance. Startups change the world, but we don't know which ones will succeed. What we do know is that if they are to fail, it is best that they fail fast. So should we. 
admit defeat and change tack. If the laws we pass, the regulatory burdens we impose on others do not, do not achieve the intended purpose. Seeped into the history of my family's journey to Australia is a yearning for freedom. Freedom of individuality, freedom to associate, freedom of self-expression and freedom of self-realisation. None of the freedoms offered in a totalitarian communist regime, but all of the freedoms found in Australia. I believe the cornerstone of these freedoms to be free markets. Take the fight against global poverty. After four decades of government-sponsored programs, we had hardly moved the needle. Within two decades of opening up markets, trade lifted billions of people out of poverty, more than in the rest of human history combined. It has reduced inequality and conflict, brought us closer, improved education, human rights and reduced discrimination, especially against women. As Thomas Friedman pointed out, in the history of the world, no two nations with a McDonald's have ever gone to war with each other. <laughs> but we cannot expect people who have not benefited from this change to welcome it. Globalisation has hurt those in developed countries with easily transferable skills. And while some will say that Australia was not competitive in manufacturing and these jobs were always destined to move elsewhere, I wonder what our reaction will be when globalisation starts to impact professions such as doctors, lawyers, accountants and nurses. Government's response to date has been to first erect tariff walls to avoid the inevitable, then bail out failing companies, many of which were owned by overseas parent companies to begin with, and finally provide welfare payments to the unemployed. No wonder many of our fellow Australians feel like victims of forces beyond their control. If I were to stand here and suggest to you that we need to implement a program that takes our most vulnerable and puts them into a system that will reduce their lifespan, education and health, increase their likelihood of teenage pregnancy and family breakdown, subjects them to increased incidents of violence and crime and entrenches this outcome from one generation to the next, you would query my state of mind. Yet in too many parts of the world, this is what the welfare system achieves. I, like my fellow Liberals, believe that welfare reform is about saving lives, not saving money. So why is reform so hard? More money does not save more lives, and less money does not save less lives. In education, we've increased spending, yet outcomes have not improved. We need to stop fighting globalisation and dedicate ourselves to giving our fellow citizens the tools they need to thrive. The greatest tool we can give them is education. As my father's family had to learn the ways of Australia and adapt to a foreign environment, so too should we adapt to the challenges of an increasingly rapidly changing world. Educational institutions in other countries like Germany, Switzerland, Singapore and places like Silicon Valley are an important part of their economy's ability to adapt and innovate. They have proven critical to ensuring that German manufacturing remains cutting edge and doesn't become a producer of commodity goods. It is through policy innovation that other countries have been able to improve their educational outcomes. In the United States and the United Kingdom, Charter schools are experimenting with different ways to educate the most socio-economically disadvantaged. Because they know, if effective, it will be education that lifts the disadvantaged out of a cycle of poverty, not handouts. But bespoke solutions require us to trust people on the ground, to figure out how best to tailor solutions to their community's needs. Some experiments will fail. But more importantly, some will succeed. And those successes will achieve far greater outcomes than we can ever imagine. It was my father who taught me that life without failure is a life half lived. He spent over 10 years building Osborne computers into the largest manufacturer of PCs in Australia. After one of their biggest clients failed to pay their bills on time, 
cash flow became stressed and the bank refused to extend the loan. The business went into voluntary administration and the bank took our family home. It was a devastating loss. It had the potential to destroy our lives. It could have robbed us of our identities and our sense of self. But that's not how we chose to see it. That's not how we decided to live it. Without risk, there is no entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. There is no progress. I don't have the answers to the problems of the future, but we will experiment, we will make mistakes, and we will learn, and ultimately, we shall succeed. As we sit here today, the overwhelming majority of Australians suffer from crippling traffic congestion. Across the nation, 40 per cent of our road capacity is underused. Every year, we carry the burden of $6 billion in avoidable road congestion, and these figures are rising. Yet groundbreaking advancements like driverless cars are no longer science fiction. They are a reality of our lifetime. They will mean more time with family and friends, improved access to employment, and might even make the most expensive real estate in the world more affordable. When it comes to energy production in this country, our systems and infrastructure are outdated. We generate energy too far away from those who use it, use our grid too inefficiently, and consumers and the environment are bearing the cost. Leaps in household battery technology, the deployment of smart grid initiatives and energy saving devices are already changing how and where we source our energy from. These changes aren't dreams or figments of my imagination. They are happening now, and they are challenging perceived wisdom in industry after industry. The question before us is what technology will wither and which will prosper. The good news is we don't have to decide. The market will decide for us. Friedman's analogy has never been more apt. In a democracy, you get the breakfast cereal that 51 per cent of people want. In a free market, you get the one you want. Free markets are not about money. They create fundamental social benefits. They empower the individual and turn our most selfish traits into public good. They civilise us all. Markets ensure that the only way to fulfil our needs is to fulfil the needs of others. A free market fosters accountability. A business owner is accountable to his employees and his customers, just as a parent is accountable for the education of their child. So a politician is accountable to their community. I am accountable to you. To the many family members, friends, supporters that have brought me here, to the overwhelming majority of Australians who contribute to our collective representative system of government, to the constituents of the modern and dynamic Northern Beaches, I am accountable to you. I will account for how I spend your money. I will account for how I make the decisions that affect you. I will be held accountable for continuously striving to do better, explore possibilities and create opportunities for you, for your children, for our today and your tomorrow. To this day, my home of McKellar has only been represented by three members. Billy Wentworth, who before many others spoke of and demanded equality and opportunity for our first Australians. Jim Carlton brought an intellectual rigour to this parliament and what it means to be a Liberal. Jim recently passed away, but not before he made a further contribution to public life as the head of Red Cross. And Bronwyn Bishop, whose dedication to this parliament and the Liberal cause will not soon be forgotten. The northern beaches of Sydney is in urgent need of transport infrastructure. Three of the seven most congested roads in Australia service McKellar and Warringah, for that matter. The value-sharing model that has been proposed by Ministers Fletcher, Constance and Stokes promises to free up billions of dollars to build the infrastructure we need. It takes the average person in McKellar nearly two hours a day just to travel to and from work. This must change. We need greater road bandwidth and more options like a metro. We need the MBN, and we need it now. This vital piece of infrastructure that the Turnbull government is rolling out will bring jobs to the area and allow more people to telecommute. 
Mum and Dad remain grateful to the people who supported them along their journey. I too will never forget those who have stood by me. Few of us come to be here by accident. For most of us, there was a lot of work, support and understanding from others. To Pat and Alana Daly, to Jose and Isabel Manano Perez, who sustained me throughout those long four years that I sat on council. Thank you. To Michael and Bronwyn Regan, Helen Wilkins, Christina Kirsch, Rick Hart, and uh, as she prefers to be called, Granny Sutton, thank you for your friendship. To Stephen and Elizabeth Chawlton, David and Karen Hand, John and Angie Bill, who ensured that the campaign was not homeless, Stu Cameron and Aunt Gleeson, you more than any others know what it is like. To the three wisest men I know in Pittwater, Jim Longley, Ross Barlow and Rob Stokes, I thank you. Although I do owe more to Rob's wife, Sophie, than I do to Rob. For it was Sophie who introduced me to my wife, Nicola. I will, I will repeat what many have said here before me. The sacrifice we make is nothing compared with that made by our families and our loved ones. Sweetheart, you have been my bedrock, my north star, and the better angel of my nature. Your fierce conscience means that you will never go gentle into the night. You have also given me the greatest gift of all. When Zara Jean was asked how old she was by the Governor-General, she told him that she was seven, but almost eight. But she wanted to know, more specifically, how old he was. <laughs> <laughs> ZJ, always stay curious. It is because of you that I keep persevering and fighting for a better world. They say that it takes a village to raise a child. I can confirm it's a pretty big village. I would like to thank the most excellent Alison Brent, who runs Zara's school, her teachers, Rebecca Willeman, Catherine Slattery and Natasha Zivanovich, and her netball coach, Susan Cook. To Jenny Stokes and Michelle Quinn, who look after Zara when Nicola and I can't be there, thank you. Hubert Humphrey lamented that every time he went to West Virginia, he kept running into Kennedys. I imagine some of the other candidates in McKellar were feeling the same by the end of the election. From my mother and father to my uncles and aunts, all my brothers and sisters, including their children, Ted and Penny, and even my self-adopted ones, Vanessa and Zach, thank you. I have bad news for those who are thinking of running in three years' time. My brother Nick and his wife Lee have just welcomed Hugh into the world. Not to be outdone, Nicola's side of the family may be smaller in numbers, but they cast a very long shadow. Simone and Mark, Chloe and Ellie, Daryl and Therese, Helen and Barry, Marguerite and John. Thank you. As has, as <laughs> they say in politics that if you need a friend, you should get a dog. I've never needed a dog. I have Andrew Constance. <laughs> as a minister, Andrew set up the sale of poles and wires in various ways, but by most famously pointing out that the very same unions who opposed it happened to own privatised water, a privatised water company in England and even a privatised electricity asset in China. With Dominic Perrottet, he has recycled endless amounts of capital to improve the lives of hundreds of thousands of people in New South Wales. Andrew was the lead minister that ensured New South Wales was the first state to reform the taxi industry in over two centuries. His example is one I hope to replicate. To his team of Chris Muir, Ryan Bloxham, Russell King, Barb Williams, Adam Actestrat, Don Kashiri and Josh Murphy, thank you. I was barely pre-selected when the Prime Minister thought it would be wise to call an eight-week winter campaign. Tony Abbott, you threw me a life boy. You gave me support, guidance and, frankly, reassurance I did not know I needed. To Nick Greiner, who inspired me to get involved. To John Emmett, Chatty and Nick Johnson, Vicky McGay, Alan Clark, Wendy Starkey, Kate Raggett, Tina and Jeff Hodgkinson, Michael and Dorothy Highland, who I know would have preferred to be sailing, to Sarah Crookshank, Leon Beswick, Natalie Ward, Alex Calvo, Audrey Harper and Deb Wilshire. Thank you for the long days you put in. To Rory Amon and Christina Cimino, thank you for the faith you showed me from the very beginning. Alex Briggs and Warren Wardell, who braved bus stops at 6am. To Matthew Coder, my old friend, 
Adam Schofield, my even older friend, Roger Massey-Green, Rick Lee and the many others I do not have time to mention here who supported us when it mattered most. My deepest gratitude. In standing here today, in this place, I have cause to reflect on Tennyson's words at the end of Ulysses. Though much is taken, much abides. And though we are not now that strength, which in old days moved earth and heaven, that which we are, we are. One equal temple, temper of heroic hearts, made weak by time and fate, but strong in will, to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. Mr Speaker, Australia's best days are ahead of us, for no other reason than we have so much to hope for and so little to fear. Thank you. Well done.